Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Jim Hammersmith, chair of the Paley Rothman Employment Law Group. Uh, we're going to get started with our webinar regarding an update on Virginia employment law in a couple minutes. Uh, we'll just give uh, two minutes for any uh, stragglers to join us, and then we'll get started. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Best screen. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? We've got a lot of ground to cover today. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a webinar, Change Comes to the Commonwealth, a Virginia Employment Law Update. And this afternoon, you're going to hear from uh, each member of our employment law group of Paley Rothman. Um, I'm going to be leading off the discussion, followed by uh, Scott Mursky, uh, Jessica Summers, and Hayes Edwards. We decided to have everybody participate here because there is a lot of ground to cover and a lot of information to cover. Um, a few uh, housekeeping things before we get started. Um, the material, uh, we had a technical issue with getting the material um, into a position so it could be downloaded from the GoToWebinar, but we did circulate it earlier this morning about 1030. If you've got it, great. If you didn't, uh, let us know and we will recirculate it to you. Um, use the question box for any questions. Don't use chat, use questions. And if you can hold your questions to the end, that would be great. Um, if not, uh, we will try to uh, get to all of them at the end of the seminar. Um, and uh, obviously you are on, um, your mic is muted, so you won't be able to, uh, to ask questions um, verbally. But we, we look forward to this. Um, each year I do a uh, update for the Society of Human Resource Managers chapter in Maryland and it's an update for the entire DMV uh, legislative activity uh, over the course of the last year and I would say I've been doing it for now oh, 10 years or so and every year Maryland takes up the majority of my time a uh, little bit of DC and then I spend about five minutes talking about the latest, greatest uh, employment law developments in Virginia because there really aren't any and haven't been any. Uh, however, with the change in the in the legislature and both both houses being controlled by the Democrats, as well as the change in the uh, governorship now being Democrats, now being held by a Democrat. The Virginia legislature and the governor got busy in the employment law area and have passed literally a slew, somewhere between 15 and 20 um, different pieces of legislation dealing with employee rights. And in some cases, uh, not only caught up to Maryland and DC, but literally leapfrogged over them. So again, there's a lot to cover and I'm gonna get us started here. In uh, your slides two and three, you'll see an overview of the various pieces of legislation that have been passed. Um, they deal with non-payment of wages, uh, non-compete agreements, the Virginia Values Act, which substantially expands protected categories um, in uh, discrimination law, as well as providing substantial new rights to employees who feel their rights have been violated. Uh, we'll be covering some whistleblower protections, misclassification of independent contractors. Uh, Virginia's getting into the fray on increasing uh, 
Uh, the minimum wage headed toward a, a $15 per hour minimum wage like its sister jurisdictions in DC and, and Maryland. Uh, general contractors have new issues regarding liability. There are new pay stub reporting requirements, uh, rights of Virginia employees to access per, and former employees to access personnel records. And then uh, Virginia's also jumped into the, uh, into the fray on ban the box. So with that, why don't we, why don't we get started here? First of all, um, for, for those of you who may have had any complaints to the Virginia Department of Labor regarding violations of the Wage Payment Act, you know that um, A, an employee who thought they were not paid the wages they should have been paid um, did not have a right to sue the employer. They could file a claim with the Virginia um, uh, Department of Employment. However, that, that was deemed to be sort of ineffectual by the most part. Um, it was a slow process. Um, it wasn't necessarily, um, uh, it wasn't a lot of teeth to it. Um, certainly you might get a notice that said you've been in violation. You could call typically and try to work those issues out. And it just wasn't all that effective or, um, or strong, um, unlike DC and Maryland. And Maryland has a very, very strong wage payment act. Well, now Virginia has a very strong wage payment act as well. Uh, first, an employee can now bring a lawsuit um, in court against an employer for violations of the uh, Virginia wage payment law. That is a game changer as far as I'm concerned. Further, there are enhanced damages against an employer that fails to pay wages as required under the Virginia wage payment law. First, the employer can be liable for the amount of wages due. The employer can also be liable for 8% interest on those wages from the date they were due. The employer can now be liable for liquidated damages, which means twice the amount that was not paid. So if an employer alleged, employee alleges that you failed to pay, uh, pay her $10,000 in, um, in wages that were due and owing, um, uh, that can easily uh, uh, double to $20,000 plus interest. Plus that, that employee could be entitled to attorney's fees if the employer knowingly failed to pay wages. And we do a lot of wage payment work. We've done a lot in Maryland and a lot in DC, obviously for the reasons I've stated before, not a lot in Virginia. These cases can be very expensive, um, particularly for a salesman who is disputing commissions and things like that. So these can be very expensive um, cases, both in terms of damages and in terms of attorney's fees. Uh, the Virginia law also states that if the employee can prove that the withholding of wages improperly was both willful and with the intent to defraud the employee, then the employee can, be, can receive up to three times the amount of wages due. So you've taken a, a failure to pay, a $10,000 failure to pay up to $20,000 plus potentially $30,000 with attorney's fees and, um, and other costs and expenses of the employee uh, also kicked in. And um, an employer can be liable for a thousand, a civil penalty of $1,000 for each violation. So again, it's gotten very, very um, uh, strong, particularly the private cause of action. That's gonna change the landscape for wage payment cases in Virginia. Now, if you're a general contractor in Virginia, it gets even worse because under the, under the changes to the wage payment law, general contractors are now liable for the failures of their subcontractors and suppliers, which are entities over which the contractor really has no control. And they'll have to pay the unpaid wages of any contractors or subcontractors who have not paid their employees. Um, the general contractor becomes jointly and severally liable for those wages to the um, to the subcontractors employees, and it not only applies to the first tier of sub, but all tiers subsequent there too. So a general contractor could be liable for payment of wages under the wage payment law and all the attendant damages I just discussed. Not only for that first tier subcontractor, but for that subcontractors contractors and the sub subcontractors employees. So it just gets, it gets worse and worse and worse. And uh, the way the statute is written is that uh, 
the obligation of the general contractor actually becomes a contractual provision written into the contract between the subs and their employees. So it's so the employees have the advantage of not only a wage payment act, but also a breach of contract claim. Um, now the, the law does provide that the that the sub will indemnify a general contractor for any damages that the general contractor has to pay. But a lot of times the general contractor is paying those damages because the subcontractor has gone out of business or is unable to pay its employees. So the, the, the indemnification provision probably ultimately rings hollow. Uh, but it's a, so, so these changes to the Wage Payment Act are going to have a significant um, impact on wage payment uh, landscape in, um, in Virginia. So now, Beth, let's move on to uh, page six, which deals with changes in the um, new laws on non-compete agreements. Uh, for those of you familiar with the landscape of non-competition agreements in Virginia, um, unlike Maryland and D.C., Virginia is a difficult place to um, to enforce a non-compete agreement or non-solicitation agreement. It's 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 more difficult than Maryland or Virginia. Um, the Virginia courts tend to be um, somewhat restrictive and um, demanding in how a non-compete agreement needs to be drafted in order to be enforceable. And now we have a law in the books from the legislature that prohibits employers from entering into enforcing or even threatening to enforce a non-compete agreement between the employer and a low wage earner. Um, it applies to all non-compete agreements or all non or provisions or agreements that are entered into uh, on January, July 1st, 2020, so in a couple of weeks. It does not prohibit the use of non-disclosure agreements, so employers can still have confidentiality agreements with all of their employees. Um, and notably, it excludes employees who, whose compensation is predominantly from sales commissions, incentives, or bonuses. And I think this is a nod to the idea that, um, that business development and salespeople have very, very close connections with an employer's um, clients and customers, and they're the ones who are really developing the goodwill and connections. And those types of employees can easily move from one company to the next and take their clients and their customers with them. So I think that's a nice nod to the reality that um, those employees have got to have um, restrictions. Otherwise, uh, uh, employers could be uh, very much at risk to lose customers and clients when salespeople move from, from, from one company to the next. Uh, like, the, like the wage payment law, the new um, uh, prohibition on non-competes provides a private cause of action by an employee against an employer who, like I said, either enforces or threatens to enforce a non-compete agreement. And uh, interestingly here, and very damaging, very, very significant, is the idea that the employee can not only get an injunctive relief, in other words, the employee can go to court and say, court, this is an illegal provision, please stop my employer from a, from from enforcing against me, but um, the, uh, the, the, the employee can also get liquidated damages. Again, liquidated damages is typically two times the amount of actual damages. Um, the employee can get lost compensation. So for example, if you have an employee making significant wages, say $100,000, dollars $200,000, and um, uh, well, I guess that wouldn't be the case, but if you have an employee making uh, say $50,000, which is going to come in under the cap, and uh, you send a letter, a cease and desist letter to the employee and the employee's future employer and say, uh, the employee has a non-compete, you can't hire this particular individual, and that individual is out of work for two months, three months, or four months, or loses a job uh, offer because of such a letter, um, uh, the former employee, the for, former employer of the company can be liable for that lost compensation, as well as attorney's fees and costs uh, attendant to uh, protecting his or her rights. Um, Jesse will cover things a little bit later at the end about all the notices and things that, that you have to do now with all the changes in Virginia laws, but, but note that uh, as on the slide here, there is a posting requirement uh, regarding this statute that the Virginia Department of Labor is going to be required to post in the workplace. And there's an anti-retaliation provision, so an employer can be liable for um, threatening an employee 
who exercises his or her rights. That we can go to the next slide, it contains a little bit more detail. So what is a low wage earner? A low wage earner is any um, employee, intern, student, apprentice, or trainee whose average weekly earnings are less than the average weekly wage uh, in Virginia. Currently, the average weekly wage is $1,125 a week or $58,500 per annum. So this is not uh, an, an insignificant um, threshold. Um, the average weekly wage is updated in Virginia on a quarterly basis. So if um, you as an employer are using a non-compete uh, for an employee, so say who's making $60,000 or $75,000 a year, um, and you give that to said employee at the beginning of his or her employment, um, as that weekly or as that quarterly figure goes up, it may end up that at some point um, that agreement becomes unenforceable. Uh, the, a lay, low wage earner also is defined to include independent contractors who's compensated for services at an hourly rate that is less than the median hourly rate Virginia is reported by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So not only does this law cover employees, it also covers independent contractors. And what exactly is a non-compete under the law? It's defined as any agreement or a provision of an agreement that restrains, prohibits, or otherwise restricts an individual's ability to compete with his former employer. And notably, the law also includes a prohibition against, um, against uh, 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 forcing employees, uh, pro prohibiting employees from providing services to a client or customer of the employer if the employee does not solicit or initiate contact with that customer. In other words, it only, not only covers non-competes, it also covers non-solicitations of customers and clients, which is perhaps even a bigger deal than the non-compete, because that means an employee can move from your company to a competitor. And if the, your client goes to that employee, the employee doesn't initiate the contact, but the, the client goes to that former employer of yours and says, hey, I would like to do business with you at your new place of employment, and I'm going to leave you know, your former employer. This this law prevents the former employer from going after the employee for that type of um, for that type of activity. So very significant changes on the wage payment front and the non-compete front in Virginia. And from here, I will turn it over to uh, Scott. Thanks, Jim, for that that summary. Um, there's also been uh, significant changes in Virginia regarding. Uh, discrimination and discrimination laws. Um, the Virginia Values Act, uh, which will go into effect in July 1st of this year, is going to significantly expand the protections that are already in place under the Virginia Human Rights Act. And essentially, um, while the Virginia Human Rights Act did uh, um, limit or prohibit discrimination, it really did not give uh, individual plaintiffs great options for filing claims against their employer. So um, now under the new act, there is substantial changes and, and um, provisions that allow the employee to bring a case in state court. And we're going to discuss that a little bit more in detail and the significance of that um, change. But also very significant is that with the new Virginia Values Act, Virginia is now the first state in the South to enact a non-discrimination protection that protects LGBTQ employees. And that is a, is a major change as well from the existing law. Prior to uh, the new act, the Virginia had protected race, color, religion, national origin, sex, pregnancy, age, marital status, and um, disability, as well as some other medical conditions. So, now we are in a situation where the, have, they've specifically added sexual orientation and gender identity, and we're on the next slide, as um, protected classes. And oh, with most statutes, it's very important to look at the definitions, and they, they, they did go ahead and define what sexual orientation means, and it's defined as a person's actual or perceived heterosexuality, bisexuality, or homosexuality. And they've also given us a definition for gender identity, which is obviously, as you can read, a gender-related identity, appearance, 
or other gender related characteristics of an individual without regard to the individual's designated sex at birth. You might have heard recently um, that the Supreme Court ruled that sexual orientation is protected under the federal employment discrimination rules. And under that case, they basically were expanding our, or, or the definition of the word sex, which, which is um, uh, included in the federal employment discrimination laws, but it does not specifically uh, delineate that sexual orientation or, or gender identity are included in those definitions. But in this case, the Virginia legislature actually went further and actually wrote um, sexual orientation and gender identity specifically into the statute. So there's no debate whether or not um, it is now included or as of July 1st will be included in um, the Virginia anti-discrimination um, laws. So on the next page, we've also outlined that the Virginia Values Act added a provision against discrimination on the basis of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. And this is important because it's including obligations of employers to provide reasonable accommodations for known limitations related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. So this is actually going to be placing, you know, an affirmative obligation on an employer who's aware that an individual is pregnant or going to be giving birth to a child, that they have to make certain um, accommodations for the employer, employee to continue working for the employer. And um, the related medical condition definition also includes um, lactation. So let's talk about these reasonable accommodations on the next slide. And the obligation is to assist the person in performing their particular job unless the employer can show that the accommodation imposes an undue hardship. Um, we know from a lot of other statutes that undue hardship is a pretty high burden. So um, um, you most likely are, it's going to be difficult for an employer to prove undue hardship. So you are gonna have an obligation to provide accommodations for uh, pregnant workers. And there's also an interesting provision in the statute that there's a rebuttable presumption that there's no undue hardship if you already offer that accommodation for other employees. And for example, might be if you allow an employee to work at home and, and a pregnant employee needs to work at home, you most likely are not, you're, you're not going to be able, or it's going to be very difficult to argue that somehow allowing the pregnant employee to work at home is an undue hardship. Uh, and you can also not require or force your employee to use leave if a reasonable if another reasonable accommodation is available. And and the statute also gives some examples of re what a reasonable accommodation might be. And that could be uh, more frequent or longer bathroom breaks, breaks to lactate, access to a private location other than a restroom, assistance with manual labor, job restructuring, mo or modified work schedule. Um, so those are important. On the next slide, we list the, the real game changers that come out of this new statute. And like I said at the beginning, it's really that the, the private cause of action rights of the um, employee have, have significantly increased and has also not only allows them the ability to go into state court, but removes certain types of caps and damages that had been in place um, under both the Virginia Act and, and the caps that are in place under the federal employment discrimination um, statutes. Um, so it is important also that the Act now specifically covers employees with 15 or more employees with all categories except age discrimination. Under the uh, old version of the Act, it was limited and larger employees were, employers were not covered for any of the protected classes. But now it's clear that if you have more than 15 employees, um, you are going to be covered under the new Virginia Values Act um, for any form of discrimination that, we've, that, we've, that is listed except age discrimination. Age discrimination is still gonna have the cap to 20 or fewer employees. And it also amends, the, um, it includes that it's any form of discrimination or retaliation, not just discharge. 
And like I said, it eliminated caps. One of the caps that it eliminates is the eliminated the 12 month back pay cap. And there's now no cap on compensatory damages. It allows punitive damages. It does put a cap of 350,000 and allows back pay, front pay, and emotional distress damages. But what we anticipate to be the most significant game changers is there's going to be a lot more cases filed in state court. Uh, and state court in Virginia is a, um, well, let's just put it this way, the federal courts that you would typically or previously had filed your employment discrimination case, cases in were very, very employer friendly. Um, so the state courts are going to be a much more attractive venue for any employee who wants to bring an employment discrimination case. And that, that's for several reasons. Um, the Virginia court, it's very hard to get a motion for summary judgment granted, which is the route that we most, um, which is the route that we pursue aggressively when we handle cases. And we typically are, you can be very successful in getting motions for summary judgments in the federal court, in the Fourth Circuit especially, which is, which covers Maryland and Virginia. But in state court, it's a lot more complicated, and especially in Virginia, they have procedural issues with affidavits, and, and usually you need affidavits to prevail on a motion for summary judgment. Another significant um, uh, issue is that in Virginia, there's very limited uh, appeal rights to the intermediate appeals court. And there is a, a, a higher court in Virginia that, that you may be able to appeal to, but you have to file a right of certiorari and that has to be granted by the court. So you may be stuck with whatever the trial court's decision is in an employment discrimination case that's filed under the Virginia, Virginia, Virginia Values Act. So in essence, it's giving a lot of power to the trial court and not a lot of options to appeal a negative decision that may come out of a of a local court in Virginia. So um, that is something to watch. We think that uh, an intelligent plaintiff's lawyer is going to be filing all of their employment discrimination claims in um, in state court and electing not to raise federal claims to avoid the, the argument that the case should be removed to federal court. So that that's going to be a very, very significant change. On the next slide, and, and Jesse's going to speak to this later regarding uh, no posting and notice requirements, but there is a posting requirement. Um, you must inform your employees about the pro prohibition against discrimination on pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions, and you have to provide them information on employees' rights to reasonable accommodations as well. And you also must provide your employees knowledge or notice of this act um, when they're hired and within 10 days after an employee provides you notice that he or she, that, that she is pregnant. So there's, this is a sweeping uh, act. There's also whistleblower protections, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Hayes to discuss those. Thank you, Scott. So beginning on page 14, I'm going to talk about the whistleblower protections that have been enacted, and then I'm going to go into misclassification rules for employees and independent contractors. And then I'm going to finish up with an update on pay stub requirements for the Commonwealth. So with the new whistleblower protections, they're, they're really nothing um, new in the context of other states or, or federally. Previously in Virginia, if an employee was terminated for exercising a right, their only ability for recompense was to claim that their termination violated a public policy. And um, as employment law attorneys know, that, that's a claim that gets used a lot, but it's a very difficult claim to prove. Um, and what the Virginia legislature has done with these whistleblower protections is create a more broad right of action that an employee can use when they feel that they have been terminated or subjected to another adverse employment action um, because they have exercised some right, reported some wrongdoing, or participated in the investigation of a wrongdoing. Um, you know, as in, as in other areas of retaliation law and similar laws, adverse employment event can be anything from termination to being passed over from it for a promotion to um, discipline or other types of discrimination. 
So in order to qualify for protection as a whistleblower, the employee has to make a good faith report of a violation or a suspected violation of a state or federal law or regulation to any supervisor or government agency. It, it can also be invoked when they participate in an investigation or are asked to participate in an investigation by a government body or by a third party. Um, refusing to engage in a criminal act is another way of triggering protection. Of course, the um, criminal nature of that act would have to be proven. Of course, if the employee refuses to do something as part of their job that they believe is a criminal act or violates another law, and that's, good, that's a good faith belief, then that would be covered too. And then finally, and, and this kind of links back to the second one, an employee can be considered a whistleblower if they actively provide information to the government. So even if they're not contacted by an investigator or somebody else who believes some wrongdoing has happened, even if it's the employee, and I guess this is the traditional meaning of the word whistleblower, who initiates the investigation, then they're covered as well. But it, it is important to remember here that this has to be a good faith belief that something wrong has happened. The, the employee can't just get in the hot water about something and then go report some crime and think they're going to be covered for whatever happens. So let's go on to the next page, talk a little bit more about whistleblower protection. And the statute of limitations here is only a one year period. And then this, like many of the laws we're talking about today, does create a private right of action, meaning that the employee can sue. And there is no need for the employee to exhaust any remedies. They can go straight to court. And then the employer is in the predicament that Scott just described, where summary judgment doesn't appear likely and appeal rights are limited. So the employee gains a lot of leverage under, under this statute. The remedies that an employee can seek are broad. They, they go from monetary damages to injunctive relief, meaning the employer is barred against taking certain actions against them, um, all the way up to reinstatement of their position. And, and I would hope and assume that judges will apply that type of relief with some discretion and only in proper circumstances. I have a hard time believing that that request for relief will be rubber stamped. Uh, without much investigation or sensitivity to the facts. Now, of course, there is the good faith element in this against the employee. And there also is the, the protection for the employer that just because employees are protected against adverse acts when they blow the whistle, this doesn't mean that employees can go around breaking the law and disclosing sensitive information or willingly making false statements. So there is an element of this law in this final bullet point that protects the employer affirmatively. So that's it for the whistleblower law. Let's go into what Virginia has passed regarding misclassification of employees as independent contractors. And again, the legislature has given employees who believe, well, I guess it would be, let's say individuals, who have been classified as independent contractors but believe they are actually employees, they have a private right of action to sue in Virginia State Court. And the parties and the court start out with the presumption that any individual who receives remuneration from another individual or entity is an employee. And the burden is then on the employer to satisfy the IRS guidelines, which we're going to talk more about on the next slide for being an independent contractor as opposed to employee. And if that um, bar is not met, if that test is not satisfied, then the conclusion will be that the person is an employee and the employer will be subject to all of the relief and damages allowed by the statute. And this does apply pretty broadly. It applies in the labor and employment context, the tax context, workers' comp, and unemployment compensation. So in other words, any misclassification of a person as an independent contractor is now actionable in Virginia. So um, the, the damages are broad again. 
you can not only recover the amount of wage, salary, and benefits that would have been given if the person had been properly classified as an employee, but the plaintiff can actually include the actual expenses they incurred as a result of not having insurance coverage, which was deprived of them because they were misclassified. Um, again, attorney's fees and costs are included, as they are with pretty much all the causes of action we're going to talk about today. So uh, this is just one more reason to make sure that classification is done properly and that um, any audits are done to make sure that protocol is correct. So on to the next slide, we're going to talk about how exactly the test for whether somebody is an independent contractor or an employee work. And I'll tell you now, you probably already know, but it's very rare that you go through this test in every single criteria counsels either for employment or independent contractor. Um, it's, it's really a matter of, of weighing the different criteria and the different facts to reach the best. And the most important aspect of this test is the degree of control and independence that the worker has. Uh, look at differently, you could, you could say it's the degree of control that the employer exercises over this individual, the amount to which the individual is dependent on the employer. So the, the first category is behavioral. And this one is also known as methods. You often hear this test broken down as means and methods. So for behavioral, we look at whether the company controls or has the right to control the worker and how they do the job, or does the worker make the decision? In other words, how broad or how specific are the instructions? You know, I like to use the example of, of painting a house. If you tell somebody, okay, paint the house blue, that, that's not exercising a lot of control over what they do. Tell them which direction to do each stroke with the paintbrush, whether you tell them to use a roller, whether you tell them which part to do in what order and in which ones to do on what days, and maybe you're getting closer to giving them specific instructions and controlling the way they do the job. Next test is listed here as financial. I like to think of that as the means test, meaning the things that are used to do the job, the, the tools, the money, the supplies. Do they come from the worker or do they come from the employer? Um, is access to reimbursement controlled by the employer, or is it simply the worker has to front all the money and then it gets paid a total amount at the end? Um, finally, we can look at the type of relationship where there's a written contract or the person is getting a certain type of benefit. Now, the problem with looking at the benefits is that's often what is being claimed is that somebody was not given benefits and they were actually an employee. So be careful on this last one because again, this is misclassification. So just classifying somebody as an employee does not allow you to say that they definitely, or I'm sorry, just classifying somebody as an independent contractor doesn't allow you to satisfy this last element and therefore have the test come out your way. Um, you know, the labels don't mean anything in the eyes of the court. The labels that the parties use that is. The other thing you can look at is whether this individual is performing the same task to a number of different companies or whether this individual is working full time in the location of one company. Um, you know, will the relationship continue after the job is done? Is it a one off? Is it you're going to be working there for a year and whatever they need you to do, you're going to do? These are all sort of factual tests that get applied. So let's move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about the retaliation um, protections that have been implemented for misclassification. So not unlike the whistleblower law that I talked about earlier, any employee who believes that they have been misclassified and makes a report or brings an action who is then the subject of an adverse employment event discharge, discipline, threatening, discrimination, they can bring an action or, or add this to their action against their employer. Um, again, it has to be a good faith report. The employee can't, or an independent contractor can't make a frivolous report in the midst of a disagreement. And then when they lose that contract, say, oh, see, they retaliated against me because I was right. Um, 
you know, they have to show good faith in the whistleblower statute. Um, the employer can be liable for civil penalties, not to exceed the amount of lost wages. Um, but as, as I read the statute, the civil penalties, along with a couple other elements we're going to talk about on the next slide, are part of a different bill. And that bill has been made to go into effect until January 1st, 2021. Whereas the rest of what we're talking about will take effect um, at the end of this month on July 1st. But let's go in to the next slide. Here we're going to talk about misclassification of employees by Virginia state contractor. So if a company is licensed by the board of contractors, they face heightened penalties. They, they have to face the same presumption of employee status and the same guidelines apply. And the tax department, or the Virginia Commonwealth Department of Taxation, is authorized to investigate and issue civil penalties against violators. They're also allowed to share that information with other agencies. Um, you know, beyond the civil penalty, which nobody likes, this statute brings up the possibility of disbarment or debarment, and obviously that's that's a death sentence for a contractor. So I look at, at statutes like this often as an acknowledgement by the legislatures that, okay, we might not have the manpower, the resources to enforce or detect every violation. We really nail the people that we do catch. We can convince everybody else of the line. So a couple, more than a couple, companies will be disbarred because of this. So it's very important to understand what this law means before it goes into effect at the end of the year. Um, and of course, with everything that I've talked about, anti-retaliation and discrimination against somebody alleging misclassification is prohibited. Go on to one more slide here for me, and this is the pay stub requirements. Um, this seems like pretty obvious stuff, but previously, Virginia did not require all this information. In fact, Virginia only required that information like this be provided upon request of the employee. Now, if your company uses paychecks or if your company uses ADP, this, this really shouldn't be an issue. But a lot of people pay in cash. A lot of people have, um, well, let's say misclassification can bring about these issues. If somebody's receiving um, what, what is paid as a 1099, but they believe should be W-2 income, these requirements can be brought up. So it's, it's just another reminder to make sure that everybody's being classified properly because mistakes like this can't be undone. Once a pay stub is issued, it is either compliant or not. And of course, although the number of hours the employee worked during the period is one of these requirements, these apply to exempt workers as well. And of course, deductions need to be noted, and that includes um, any kind of deductions, whether it's tax withholdings, uh, insurance premiums, or it's subject to an employee loan, which is being deducted from their paycheck. If there are any deductions, they need to be labeled clearly. Um, and, and again, the hours work for salaried um, and piecework employees is required, and, and this does start at the end of the month. So I'm going to hand it off to Jesse now for the next subject. Thanks, Hayes. Uh, so taking you guys down the home stretch, we have a few more uh, new developments. Um, one that was actually a development from last year. So the Virginia legislature passed this bill in uh, 20, the spring of 2019, and it went into effect of July 1st, 2019, um, related to the employee access of personnel records. Um, this applies both to current and former employees and is the first time that Virginia has ever required that employees or former employees um, be provided access to any part of their personnel records. Before this statute, um, businesses could flat out deny any access to personnel records absent, you know, obviously litigation or subpoenas. Um, here, um, under this context, a current or former employee can request their records 
Um, they are not entitled to get the entire personnel file, so that's important to note. Um, they're only entitled to get the information related to the dates of their employment, wage and salary information during their employment, their job description and job title, and then any information related to injuries on the job that were sustained while they were employed. So performance evaluations, um, any other items that you might have in the personnel file that does not need to be part of the packet that is provided to employees who make requests in accordance with the statute. Um, certainly, it's optional to provide that if, if the business chooses to, um, but it is not mandated by the new law. Um, the information does need to be provided within 30 days of getting a written request um, from the employee or the former employee. Um, there can be an extension um, if you notify the employee in writing about why you can't complete the request within 30 days. Um, you know, obviously, with everything going on right now, um, to the extent that the office has been closed or there's an issue going on with COVID, um, that would certainly be a reasonable um, a reasonable reason why the business couldn't turn something around within 30, uh, 30 days and may need an extension. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are some limits as to um, when the disclosures are required. Um, it's important to note that these are really related to um, concerns about what the employee uh, or former employee might do once they get information or access to the records. Um, it does not completely eliminate the obligation to produce. Um, there are very pretty limited situations where the business doesn't have to disclose. Um, the first is if a, the employee's treating physician or a psychologist has placed a note in the employee's file basically saying disclosure of the file or information that's in the file could endanger the employee or some other person's health or physical safety. Um, so if the if an medical personnel has put something like that in the file, um, the business does not need to produce the information to the employee. Um, the business still needs to produce the information to the employee's attorney or an authorized insurer who's part of the request that the employee is making, just not directly to the employee, and the employee can be shielded from that information. Uh, the same process is true um, if the employee requests information um, that would refer to someone who is not a health care provider but who might su suffer substantial harm if the employee has access to that information. Again, pretty limited circumstances, but in these cases, um, the disclosure can be limited to the employee's attorney um, or an authorized insurer. Um, it's important to note that there is um, the possibility for the business to recover some costs related to um, the access to the personnel records. You can charge employees if it's paper, um, records, you can charge them a copying fee. If it's electronic records, you can charge them to, um, for any type of less cost associated with, reasonable costs associated with electronic production. Um, these, this new law does not change the document retention rules. So the existing document retention rules related to all different types of the, the personnel file um, that may be applied by federal or state law. Um, that's a whole separate presentation and, and conversation, but those rules remain unchanged. So if, if you've been routinely um, removing or eliminating parts of personnel files, for particularly for employees who are no longer there, um, and then get a request from a former employee, provided that what you did was in accordance with the procedures and, and permitted um, paperwork reduction procedures, um, you obviously can't be expected to produce something um, that is no longer available. Next slide, please. Now, if the business refuses or fails to promptly and within 30 days or provide, get an extension, uh, produce the records, the employee does have the opportunity to go to court and get a subpoena from the court um, to mandate the employer to produce the records. Um, if the court finds that the employer had willfully refused to produce the records, um, the employee employer can be required to reimburse the employee um, for their expenses and to cover the costs and attorney fees um, associated with the employee getting that subpoena to compel um, the employer to produce. So important to note, particularly for those of you who are responsible for managing requests, as I'll go into in a moment, um, certainly going to be something that needs to be updated in any policies to employees that state that employees do not have access to their personnel files. Next slide, please. Uh, another big development that we've had in Virginia is that Virginia is getting on 
um, the train with Maryland and DC and headed towards a $15 an hour minimum wage. Um, before all this, Virginia was tracking the federal minimum wage. So um, they were still at a $7.25 an hour minimum wage. Um, the increases are going to start next year, as you'll see from this chart. Uh, essentially, what's going to happen is we have three increases that are guaranteed by the new statute. Um, then it is going to be up to the General Assembly to reenact um, the increase schedule by July 1st of 2024. If they do not reenact the schedule, um, then simply a standard inflation increase will be applied um, going forward. If they do reenact, uh, then we have the new $13.50 and $15 an hour, um, and then um, consumer price index increases after that. So what happens after um, 2023 is going to depend on whether or not the General Assembly decides to extend things. But we are, are on course for increases in 2021, 2022, and 2023. Um, other items to note as far as um, changes to the minimum wage, there is a, there is a permission for a special training wage. So um, with the new increased minimum wage, employers are permitted for up to 90 days to pay employees 75% of the required minimum wage while they are in training. Um, so if you have someone who just starts day one and is actually working, um, this is not permitted, but if you have someone who's going through an active training program, um, you are permitted to pay them training wages for up to 90 days. Um, the statute also removes some of the categories that were pre previously exempt from the minimum wage requirements. Um, in particular, this is home health care providers, persons with certain disabilities, um, employees who do piecework, uh, and domestic service workers. Um, in general, the legislature determined that largely that was impacting particularly certain minority groups and, and mostly females, um, and found that it was no longer appropriate to have um, special wage categories for these groups. So these groups are going to be back in the pool of people who need to be getting this new higher minimum wage. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, the, the latest one, I think the most recent of the, the new laws we're going to be discussing, um, is the ban the box for simple marijuana possession in Virginia. So. Um, Virginia, just in the last month or so, uh, passed a new law that has decriminalized the simple possession of marijuana. Um, it is now only going to be a civil violation with a maximum fine of $25. Um, there are still criminal penalties for any um, possession that is you know, suggestive of distribution or intent to distribute. So large possession is still going to be um, charged as a crime. Simple possession um, is going to be now subject to the decriminalized statute. Um, the big thing that this means for employers is that records that are related to arrests, charges, or convictions for these new simple marijuana possessions are not going to be open for public inspection. Um, and additionally, employers cannot ask employees um, on an app or ask applicants on an application or ask employees to disclose whether they've been arrested, charged, or convicted of this simple marijuana possession and applicants may expressly refuse to provide the information. Uh, businesses that have not caught up and, and willfully violate the rule by putting this information on, um, whether it is a job application or um, bringing it up in an interview, um, if it is a willful violation, there can be criminal penalties applied to the employer. So it's very important to make sure that anyone who's um, handling the application forms, make sure that all the applications are updated to reflect this, um, and that anyone who's doing interviews is also aware of this change. Next slide, please. So we've gone over a, a whole host of different new laws, which have probably left your head spinning a bit. Um, as Jim mentioned, this is really an unprecedented wave of Virginia sort of sprinting from the back of the pack to catch up with its uh, counterparts in D.C. and Maryland in a way we really haven't seen elsewhere in the area um, in the past number of years. So it is a lot to digest for Virginia employers. Um, a few of sort of the overarching checklist of items that you as a Virginia employer really should be focused on, um, just to go over each one of these, is uh, reviewing and updating your payroll practices, um, making sure, first of all, that you're complying with the new minimum wage law, 
that you're complying with the pay stub requirements that Hayes talked about, um, and that you're ensuring that you have a system for employees to report and the business to review and correct potential errors. Because remember, with the new wage payment laws, there are significantly higher penalties available to employees for an error. Um, additionally, you'll want to be posting the workplace notices, um, as we've noted related to the non-compete laws, related to the updated Virginia Human Rights Act. Um, there are a number of new posters that need to go up. So if you're one of those businesses that purchases your poster from um, an aggregating source, certainly reaching out before July 1st to get that new poster, um, because most of these laws are all going into effect as of July 1st, making sure you have those new posters up and ready, um, available to employees. Next slide, please. Uh, reviewing handbooks and policies is, is probably going to be the biggest um, work for, for uh, employers to do. Um, obviously, you need to update to reflect uh, new protected statuses um, in your EEO policies. Um, as Scott mentioned, the Virginia Human Rights Act um, requires that there is the information about the um, protection and non-discrimination protection both posted and put in any employee handbook. So making sure all of the new provisions and new protected categories are reflected. Um, as I mentioned, complying with the employee access to personnel record laws. So eliminating or modifying any prior policy that may have stated that employees are not permitted access um, and instead explaining to employees what they are permitted access to and how that procedure works. Um, additionally, including policies on reasonable accommodation of pregnancy related disabilities. Um, for those of you who have um, employees in Maryland and the District of Columbia, you may have worked with us before on creating those policies that are already mandated in Maryland and D.C. Um, similar principle here in Virginia where you're going to need to be introducing that type of policy to explain to employees with pregnancy-related disabilities how they request an accommodation, what types of accommodations might be available, and how that process works. Um, including a whistleblower protection policy with a non-retaliation provision will also be important, particular emphasis on the non-retaliation provisions um, to make it clear that you are being compliant with the whistleblower protection law that Hayes talked about, and then also making sure that employees um, are flagged and knowledgeable uh, about non-retaliation and making sure your managers are aware of that as well to the extent you do have a whistleblower issue come up. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, reviewing your existing and new contracts. Um, first of all, as we talked about with the general contractor issues, um, potentially incorporating an indemnification provision to make sure that in the event that your subcontractors, employees have a wage and hour issue, um, you as a company are going to be protected uh, by your subcontractor. So you're not going to have subcontractor employees coming after you for claims or um, to the extent that they are permitted to come after you for claims in this under the new law, um, you are going to be protected with indemnification from your um, subcontractor. Uh, also making sure that you're not inappropriately using non-competes, as Jim talked about, for the low-wage workers, um, and then looking at amending existing agreements to eliminate impermissible non-competes to either reduce them as needed or um, to modify them to make sure you do not have any void agreements out there. Um, and then finally, taking the time to review and reassess your independent contractor classifications um, to make sure that you, as Hayes talked about, you don't have anybody who's falling sort of outside of what can qualify as an independent contractor under the Virginia law, so you're not running into issues there related to individuals claiming that they should have been employees when they were classified as contractors. So with that, I think we are wrapped up and ready to take some of your questions. I'll turn it back to you, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Uh, thanks, Jesse and Scott and Hayes. A uh, couple questions were typed in along the way and we've provided answers or said we will clarify or look for the answers if we didn't have it immediately. Um, and uh, if there are any other questions, please uh, chime in now. We'll give a couple minutes for that to happen. Um, otherwise, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, it is a whirlwind session with a lot of information. Um, I, all, I feel like we are all drinking from a very large fire hose at this point with um, the COVID-19 issues and the return to work issues and uh, OSHA guidelines and CDC guidelines and trying to figure all that out. 
and some of this other stuff um, kind of ended up flying below the radar, but it is very significant for those of us employing uh, employees in Virginia. And of course, we have some recent um, uh, high level, very significant Supreme Court decisions that are coming down on top of it. Um, so a lot to pay attention to uh, at this time as an employer in the DMV area. And as always, we're here to take your questions and phone calls um, as you try to wade through it all. Um, I think we are largely good on questions. So um, with that, I'm going to say goodbye and again, thank our panelists and thank all of the attendees for participating and spending your lunchtime with us. Uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.